Well, I am the last of, at my age group, I'm told that I'm the last of the baby boomers. I was shielded and uh, from mostly all of the racial strife that was going on at the time. I lived in an African-American community, Gifford. Um, everybody and everything around me were African-Americans. I went through one year of uh, segregation, which was uh, as a first grader. And then uh, when I went to the second grade, uh, that's when all of the schools um, were integrated. Incidentally, I was told that Indian River County where I grew up at, which I didn't know until many years later, was the last school system in the United States of America to become <laughs> integrated when I went to the second grade. And um, so I really didn't, I didn't know anything. I, you know, I, I was sheltered from, from just about every, all, all of the racial strife and stuff. Because like you were in a all black community. As far as I'm concerned, that's pretty much, you know, I, I heard things. I was actually with my mother um, when she found out that Martin Luther King had been uh, assassinated. The lady across, uh, that lived next door, uh, called over and, and let us know. And, and I remember um, my mother I said, being so shocked. And I, I was asking her, who, who is it? Boy, be quiet, be quiet. Let me get the, the details. And then she explained to me later who it was. Uh, and and I, I distinctly remember that day. Okay, so when did art come into the... As a child, growing up in Gifford, <clears throat> again, this African-American community that, that, that I grew up in, we had little candy stores and, you know, in the neighborhood. And um, as a small child, I think I first noticed uh, George Buckner when I was about mm, probably about eight years old and he had a little studio uh, across the street from one of the little candy stores uh, in Gifford, Mosley store and so we'd run over there and buy candy and there'd be this guy and his brother painting out in front of their little studio directly across the street and so we'd wander over there as children and just kind of looking uh, see you know, what what he was doing and just being excited about watching the artist uh, do his thing. And George would tease with us and his brother mainly Ellis. We called him Boo. He's a real big guy. And he'd tease us and say, well I painted an alligator in there. Look, I'll give you a quarter if you can find it. But you gotta realize how much you could buy with a quarter back during those days. That was a lot of money. And children being children, we, we were finding alligators all in the sky and everywhere else trying to get the quarter. And he just laughed. I think he got a lot of um, amusement out of that. Boy, an alligator don't have wings. He <laughs> 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 got to be on the ground. So that was their way uh, of getting us interested in, you know, what they were doing and trying to get us to look uh, with a little bit more detail. At, you know, and try to be observable. With a few of us, some of it stuck. I was one of the ones that I just kept hanging around and asking questions, and I could do that, and you think you could do that, and you know, I, and trips and drabs. That's where my interest, uh, that's where it began. So, where, where did you pick up from there? Because you are a sign painter. Oh, or... yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I guess the best way to describe that is <clears throat> I first met George Buckner um, as a youngster, about eight years old. But then we became reintroduced because when I first met George, I didn't know that George was a musician. And our church didn't have a musician. And so my mother, being the person that she was, they couldn't afford uh, to pay a, a musician. So somehow or another, she arranged to have a church to have let me take piano lessons and so forth. And um, then I needed to pick up how to play a different type of music other than how to read, but how to play church music. And so um, I was reintroduced to George Buckner to go and learn some chords and different things like that. And I said, I know that man, that's a painter guy, you know what I mean? And so we had this unique connection. So that's where the music connection came in. Now, George, uh, was one of the finest musicians you ever want to come across. He played, he was multi-talented. 
and um, he played with a fellow uh, by the name of George Tiny York, and the name of their group was called the Melodians. Uh, George Tiny York, Tiny, we called him, was the guy that actually got Ray Charles going. And uh, Tiny was from uh, Jacksonville, Florida, and um, he met a young lady from Vero Beach, and he was traveling all over the country doing music and stuff, but uh, the young lady's father told Tiny, he said, I don't, I don't mind if you marry my daughter, but uh, you're not going to be running all over the country. <laughs> and that's how Tiny York wound up in Vero Beach, you know. And so Tiny was instrumental in teaching me music. I, he had me playing at a young age, him and his daughter. And, and George was a guitar player in that group, and we just started picking up stuff from there. And half the time, when George was teaching, teaching me to play, he might have been painting or doing something, and I'm looking over his shoulder. And, uh, and I always wound up over to the easel <laughs> or something like that. So that's, you know, that was, you know, how I got started. Um, I think um, my first curio curiosity started with art around eight years old. I could finally paint something worth something when I was about 13. I, I always wanted to be, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I always wanted to have my own little thing. Um, in the community that, that, that I grew up in, um, it fostered, there, there was a big effort to create uh, young people that uh, were civic-minded and um, self-sustaining. That's the kind of household I grew up in. So entrepreneurship was something that was a part of my daily diet. Now, I did maybe 30 years or so in, in, in the sign business. The way that, one of the ways that uh, I got to the sign business was I saw a piece of work one day that I thought was just absolutely fabulous. It was a hand carved sign and it was just something I'd never seen before. And I saw one stop in the business and asked the lady who did it. And she told me it was a gentleman by the name of Kurt Oxford. He's a really nice guy. And uh, I can't tell you how he did it, but his shop is right down so and so and so and so. So I went by and introduced myself and um, I, um, was so fascinated. He was one of the best artisans I'd, I'd ever came across, and I had some background uh, in it. And um, I, later I told George, you know, that, about this fellow. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, I heard about this guy. He says, you know something, Michael? A lot of people call me to do signs, and I don't have time to do them. As a matter of fact, call these people. <laughs> he says, I want to call them, you know, because I can't take all these calls. So. My first introduction, believe it or not, was uh, George Buckner um, actually had referred me to some people that had, he just didn't have time to do it. So I went down, I didn't know anything about it, but I went down and figured it out. And, and next thing I know, I was doing it. And so it was pointed out to me, you know, everybody else running around, you know, doing all the highwaymen stuff. You could do that, but there's an area to know nobody is going into it. You can get all of that, <laughs> you know. So. That's, you know, that's when my interest was peaked. Um, um, yeah, I, I was young, too. I was, I was 15, 16 years old you know, during that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I started out uh, from lettering, um, basic lettering on glass, and I learned how to do sandblasting and carving, right on up to McDonald's and Burger King type signs and things of that nature like that. Um, to the, I went from one end to the other, and incidentally, there are out of out of the 26 original um, highwaymen, A. E. Bacchus and John Maynard um, are are the only ones that um, delved over into signage. And the reason that I make mention of that is the structures of being a good sign writer mandates that you use a particular pattern to get something to come out right. And the training that you have to acquire to, to be a, a, a pretty good sign writer um, 
most of the other fine artists, they never learn that stuff. So it, I, when I actually got back to doing uh, landscapes in the way that I do them, I came with a different set of skills. And I'm, I'm glad I learned the hard work of how to letter and do the different things of that nature. Stuff is always big, bold color and by my lights. Um, I've been around many different um, highwaymen um, and you pick up a few pieces over here, pick up some over here, and, and these are just some small examples of my style. Now, my style is markedly different from, like, take George Buckner, for example. Our styles are totally different, but what I found out is you start out, you may try to imitate what someone else does until you find yourself, okay? So I'm, I'm more of an impressionistic um, uh, landscape artists. Now, there are a couple of different schools. Um, there's the Fort Pierce crowd, so to speak, Fort Pierce, Florida uh, artists, and then there's the Vero Beach Gifford artists. And I found that many of the artists that came out of Gifford were a little bit more premeditative in terms of uh, their approach to doing this. But I also like some of the stuff that the guys were doing on the Fort Pierce side, like Al Hare, for example. He was a very, very rapid painter, okay? And he would tell somebody, you know, well, um, and I never met Al Hare because he, he, had, he was, had, was deceased before I really got old enough to know him. But I've been told that um, he would leave out some details but the statement that he would make is that the human mind will, will put in the rest. And so I liked that idea. And uh, so I find myself somewhere in the middle uh, between um, the Vero Beach influences and some influence from some of the uh, landscape artists of the Fort Pierce area, particularly for the, the fast style. So I see you have uh, some very colorful pieces, and then you also have a, a monochromatic one. This is a that's an interesting that's an interesting thing. I um there were a couple of people. There was a, a fellow by the name of Sylvester Wells and uh, James Gibson, uh, whom I had an opportunity to meet, and we had um, some discussion, and we were talking about value of color, and uh, so he was trying to explain to me as a youngster about. Uh, value of color and uh, then he just kind of stopped and said well look at this just take these two colors black and white and do a whole painting and see how many different shades you can get out of black and white and then you'll understand value of color you mix black with white you can get some gray and you can get varying degrees of gray and varying degrees of, of um, of blacks and, and so forth, and it helps you to understand how you can do that with red, and how you can do that with blue, and come up with a grand scheme of things. So that was my first introduction to that. It just started out as a practice piece. And uh, so I was somewhere one day painting on something, and um, I felt somebody looking at me, so I turned around, saw the guy, and the fellow says to me, man, I love that painting, I love that painting right there. How much for it? How much for it? And before I can say anything, the guy says, well, I only got so much money. He says, will that be enough? And I started laughing. And uh, I said, well, I'm not done with it yet. He said, oh, no, 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 don't do anything else. Don't do it. I want it just like that. So he gave me the money and I sold the painting. He was laughing when he left and I was laughing too. And uh, so I started over again with the same thing and somebody else came up and wanted another black. I said, oh, black and white. So I started doing black and white and I've been doing it for, for years. And some people, that's what they particularly like. You know, and I, and I, um, the longer you do it, the more you find out what, what people's tastes are, you know. And, and I'm like this, if they like it, I love it. So. Um, that's the black and white. Um, these other pieces over here, these are called backcountry. That's a backcountry piece to my to my right and to my left. 
this is uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, Blue Cypress Lake, uh, which is uh, uh, in the middle of the state of Florida, uh, in the area of the Florida Turnpike and Highway 60. And the one to my far right, far to my far left, is called uh, Old River Road. And uh, Old River Road uh, is the Indian River in Indian River uh, in the background and Indian River Drive running in front of it and kind of back off in the distance you can see the Sebastian, the bridge that goes to the Sebastian Inlet. Now this is a good place to kind of take a pause because um, <clears throat> you will find that in highwayman paintings there can be some repetitiveness in terms of subject matter. Now that, that comes from a couple of different um, areas. When the highwaymen started out you know, a couple guys, it was a very loose association of, of artists, but, you know, certain ones that were friendly uh, towards each other might ask the other one, how'd you do this weekend? Man, I didn't do worth them. <laughs> that's why I suggest you better pay you some old river roads, because that's what everybody's buying. And so they would trade information. And down through the years, you find out that there are certain um, sceneries that people consistently like. Oh, you just can't paint enough of them. People like them, and, but... Uh, in, in the art world, depending on the time of the day, one scenery, you can paint it 10 different ways based on the uh, outside conditions. And so, um, Royal Ponciana's, which I don't have any uh, in here today, um, but just certain things people just like. And so that's why we always uh, wind up. You got any Royal Ponciana's? You got any of those river sceneries? You got any cypress trees? You got any? I like those, uh, the things from the Everglades and the backcountry stuff. You got any of that? And uh, that's, you know, what people ask for. You paint what people want. You give the people what they want. And uh, this one over here uh, to my far right is a, a backcountry piece, but it's a real bold in color. And what happens is most houses. Nowadays, they have very uh, neutral colors, and someone may want something to kind of uh, add some flavor to a room, kind of light it up, or something to uh, kind of add a focal point. So, um, bold color is something that um, uh, kind of stuck out with, with highwaymen stuff. Now, this is my version. Everybody's got their own style and their own way of doing it, but the boldness and color of color is um, um, one of the things that are most noticeable and recognizable. Mary Ann Carroll, the one um, lady that was a Florida high, high, highway woman, if you will, uh, if that's the proper way to say that, uh, was a master of bold color. And that's kind of like women know how to put colors together, you know, like when you dress. And so that was her style. And she uh, saw the works of uh, uh, Harold Newton and she was impressed and she got drawn into it. And, and then she found herself and, and has um, um, achieved a great deal of success. Do you, you know her? I didn't know her personally, but she's from Gifford. Mm -hmm. And her, uh, <laughs> it's funny you say that. Um, her name, her, her maiden name is uh, Mary Ann Sneed. And one of the first big sales I ever had in my life uh, was at an auction and somebody bought some of my work. And that was her maiden name, Mary, Mary Ann Sneed, S-N-E-A-D. And uh, she got married and her name became uh, Mary Ann Carroll. So at an auction, someone thought they were, I signed my name, M. Sears. But they thought they had bought one of the earlier Mary Ann <laughs> Sneeds. I said, wow, wait, this boy did right. And the guy said, you know, why will I bought that thinking that was uh, Mary Ann Sneed? But hell, I like it anyway. And so that was, and, and that's, uh, the Sneeds lived not too far from where I live. Um, there was one fellow that I did not mention. His name is uh, uh, Alfonso uh, Moran. We call him Poncho. Uh, he lived three or four houses down from me, and uh, he, he was quite a character that uh, really took up time with children. And uh, Poncho uh, was a real big, tall guy. And uh, 
he taught us how to shoot pool and his favorite pastime. And uh, he was a highwayman and so forth. But the thing about Poncho is that he taught you strategy, you know, how to place things and symmetry and how light works in nature. You can look around you and he would explain things and he caused us to look at things with the with the, with, with the real artistic eye and it helped us to understand how physics works. Okay, and so we were getting all this, you know, nobody ever um, seems to tell the story of how other African-American men have taught and what their legacy truly is. Now, Gary Monroe, the fellow that got this whole highwayman book business started and brought a lot of notoriety to the highwaymen, one thing that was left out in that is the legacy of the original uh, uh, highwaymen, and I am indeed the product but nobody ever talks about that sort of thing. They call they call the second generation guys and so forth, and they concentrate more on the um, the original twenty six, so to speak. But people are now beginning to pay attention 